we live in such a day, you've heard me say before, just one major financial uh, medical problem or of some sort can can really uh, take a toll on a family. And uh, it's just by the grace of God that uh, as we look at our lives, sometimes that we we aren't homeless and we don't we don't face some of the things other people face. And uh, so uh, we're going to be in the book of James again tonight. And we're going to close out this study, this fifth chapter. Uh, it, we see a, a word for the last days uh, found there in the beginning part, that theme. Uh, we've seen uh, thus far a word for the rich in the first six verses. And we've seen a word uh, for the redeemed in verse 7 through verse 12. And we've seen a word uh, for the restricted uh, in verse 13 through verse 15. We saw Sunday night a, a word for the righteous. Uh, in verse 16 through verse 18. And then tonight we'll look at the last two verses. Verse 19 and verse 20. And we're going to see in these last days. We see a word for the restorers. The, a word for the restorers. Uh, verse 19. If you'll stand in honor and reading of James chapter 5. If you're able and you can tonight. We're going to read those two verses. Brethren. If any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which curveth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Thank you. Be seated. Uh, as we have thus far seen uh, this word for every audience, pretty much in this fifth chapter, uh, keep in mind that we're seeing a uh, the closing of this letter by James. James is sort of equivalent to the book of Mark, many say. Uh, he gives us that servant mentality. Uh, James is probably one of the, the most uh, uh, powerful and personal books you'll find in the New Testament, and in that of the epistles. But he closes out, and then notice he's speaking to a group of Christian Jewish brethren here because he uses the term brethren in verse 19. Uh, so he wants to say something to them. First of all, he shows, that, first of all, uh, this word for the, the restorers because that's what he's going to deal with, the sin of which we're often guilty. Notice he says brethren, uh, if. Notice that, that word if uh, sometimes is a word that can mean sense but it doesn't here it's a conditional word it's a, a word of possibilities it speaks of a uh, possibility he so he says uh brethren if uh, you do err from the truth so there, he's speaking of the possibility here of erring from the truth uh as you think about that that word err literally it means to leave the path uh that word err means to go astray it means to wander it means to roam about. It means to be led away from a path of virtue. It literally gives us the idea of be going stray or astray. It really goes to the Old Testament idea of backsliding. Now, there's not a person here tonight, no matter who, how holy we are, that we, we don't face that temptation, that we don't face that possibility of gu being guilty of erring from the truth or going astray or wandering or roaming about. Uh, we know that because James, uh, excuse me, uh, Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 12 uh, about drifting away. Uh, in chapter 2, excuse me, in chapter 2 he wrote about uh, drifting away. And the caution there, the very first caution he gave in his letter here in the book to the Hebrews was that of drifting. That of drifting away. The same idea of straying. He says, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard in verse 1. Lest any time we should let them slip. There's the idea of drifting right there. Or straying away or backsliding. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense or reward, he says in verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness with both signs and wonders and with various miracles and gifts to the Holy Ghost according to his own will. And he goes on and he sp speaks in, in, in this first part uh, of his, this first caution. That's what he's dealing with with, is a, with drifting of straying or backsliding. So it's very important. That he, it means to leave the path. And that's the sin that every one of us uh, that we can be guilty of if we're not very careful. 
So he says, brethren, if, if, speaking of the possibility, if you do err from what? The truth. So he says to err from the truth. Notice the, you see the root of the, the idea of error, E-R-R-O-R, -E -E you see the word err, don't you? So to err is to err. So you see, Paul constantly wrote about our, our belief belonging to our behavior. Uh, he also talked about our living and our believing. Belief and behavior, they complement one another. And it has to do, when we're living in error, our belief is not going to match our behavior. So we need to understand that. So he says to, we, to leave the path is what it means. It means to live in perversity, uh, to err from the truth. It means to fall away from the true faith into heresy. And folks, as you realize tonight, most folks that are in the uh, denomination of Jehovah Witness, most of them were Baptists. You know what they've done? They've erred from the truth. They've fallen for heresy. And sad to say, many of the cults that we have today, uh, sad to say, many started out right and they wandered away and they got off track. And he's warning them in this book that they've got to be very careful not to do the same thing. You see, it means to, to err from the truth means to live a lie. You, every day that we live, it seems like there's a battle today, and there's a departure, there's a falling away, there's a wandering, there's a roaming about uh, of that of truth. Brethren, he says, if any of you do err from the truth, uh, keep in mind that truth's truth. Uh, there can only be one truth. And I, yes, there's some gray areas, but if you're searching for the truth, you're going to know the truth because the truth is the only thing that will really uh, set you free or make you free. So as you understand that, uh, we see today we live in a generation that has erred from the truth. We've got, we've got this idea today that, well, you can't know the truth. Well, you, you can know the truth according to the Scripture. He said, Jesus said, my word is truth. So we have the truth before us. There is truth. This is the truth. We, we, well, listen, it is the truth. It's, it's the standard by which we're always governed. That's the second point I want to make. So as we see this in the last days, we have a word for the restorers. We see he mentioned the sin which we're often guilty, but he also talks about the standard by which we're always governed. What governs us, ladies and gentlemen? What keeps us in control? I'm grateful tonight that you and I possess a copy of God's Word, which is truth without any mixture of error. When we say the Bible is the inspired, infallible, inspired, inerrant Word of God, when we speak of its inerrancy, we're saying that we have a book that is truthful and it is, has no mixture of error. That's what we mean by when we say that. So keep that in mind. We may err from the truth, but the truth will never be an error. Don't forget that. And that's what James is saying. Again, we may err from the truth, and the possibility is that it is prevalent for all of us to do that. But there's one fact. The truth will never be in error. I'm reminded of Psalm 119, verse 30 through verse 32 of what the psalmist wrote. Listen to what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, verse 30 uh, through verse 32. He said, I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. I have st stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord. Put me not to shame. I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. Wow. You see, what's he saying? David's acknowledging here in this text. The word, the word and our hearts work as a team. God takes the word. He illuminates the word through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it finds a lodging place in our heart. It convicts us, it comforts us, it challenges us to, get, to keep our wills controlled uh, by, the, the, by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. So we see the standard by which we're always governed. What is it? It's the truth, James says. Do not err from the truth and one convert him. That leads us to the third point there in verse 19, latter part of verse 19 and verse 20. We see the system through which we're, we're hopefully guided, okay? Uh, you see, compassion is the system that guides the church. Uh, the church really is a body of believers who've been indwelled and filled with the Spirit. We've been born again. 
and, and there's a system of love and commitment that, that, that operates in and within us. And see, it takes a team effort to restore a brother or sister in Christ. And that's what he's leaning toward here, okay? Uh, so, first of all, notice there's really three characteristics of a true rescuer. Because that's what he's going to deal with here as he, talk, as he talks about you and I being restorers in the last day. <laughs> yeah, every one of us knows somebody who's fallen from the faith. They've left church. They, they've given up on God, whatever the case may be, uh, and they need to be encouraged. They need to be reached, uh, and we, they need to be restored. And it's our responsibility to, with the best ability that we can to be restorers. Well, if we're going to be a, the restorer in these last days, God wants us to be. Uh, what are the characteristics of, this, of a true rescuer? First of all, we must be realistic. We, we got to be realistic. Uh, first of all, we got to be honest. Okay, uh, we've got to be honest. He says, and one. He says, but if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Be honest. In other words, stop and think for just a moment about your life. You realize that you, you are also a candidate to fall away. Doesn't matter how long you've been saved, how long you've been serving the Lord, if it wasn't for the grace of God. Notice he says something here. In verse 9, he says, if any of you do err. Notice these phrases. It's, if any of you do err, by the way, you know why he says that? Because he said, listen, we do stray. We do stray. Uh, that's why we need regular study. That's why we need prayers. That's why we need to confess. That's why he said if we confess our sins, he's willing just to forgive us our sins. You know, listen, John knew that we're going to sin. We're, we can't live in sinless perfect, perfection. There's no way. We ought to sin less. Listen, uh, we ought to sin less, okay, but we're not sinless. We're, we stray. Uh, we're sinners who've been saved by grace. And the bottom line is, when we do, we're going to suffer like everybody else does. And that's what he's saying. We've got to be honest. Uh, that We have to be realistic. That's what he's saying in this text. He says, if any of you do, we've got to be honest. We've also got to be hopeful. We've got to be hopeful. We've got to be honest about ourselves. But we've got to be honest with ourselves first before we can be honest with somebody else who's fallen by the wayside. And those who have fallen by the wayside, we got if we're going to restore them, we've got to be realistic about ourselves. We've got to be honest, but we all got also got to be hopeful when it concerns them. And we need to work to restore our brothers and sisters in Christ who've departed from the will of God and the Word of God so that they might return and they can be restored from their error or their erring. Then we've got to be helpful. Look what he says. He says, first of all, if any of you do, and then he says, and one convert him. Uh, he which converteth him. That word converteth means to bring back. Now that word's not saying that you're going to convert somebody. Okay? It's not saying that you're going to you're going to save them. You can't. You don't have the power to do that. Only God can do that through his grace. What he is saying is this. We have the ability sometimes and we have the testimony and we, we have the responsibility uh, to bring back and to turn those who have departed in their relationship to God back to true worship to God. So in other words, God can use us. He can use us. He can use our encouragement. He can use our walk with God and our relationship and our faithfulness sometimes to, to minister to them in ways that other people can't. You're going to be able to reach people that I can't touch. And I'm going to be able to reach people you can't touch. But God's going to place those people in our lives that have erred from the truth. They've wandered away from God. They've departed. And some of them, believe it or not, they, they've left the true faith into heresy. And it may seem that there's no hope for them. But as long as God's on his throne, there's still hope. Proverbs 10, verse 12. I'm reminded of that scripture in 1 Corinthians 9. Listen to what Proverbs the book of Proverbs says uh, in verse 10, chapter 10, verse 12. Uh, listen to what the writer of Proverbs says there in that text. Jot it down. I'll read it to you. He says this. Hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth all sins. That's a powerful verse. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 22. I'm reminded also there of what Paul said. Listen to what he said in chapter 9, verse 22. Uh, he said, To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Uh, in other words, Paul 
uh, with the, the influence he had and the ability he had to speak fluently several languages. He didn't put himself up on a, a, a status apart from other people. He says he became weak. And it doesn't say that he sinned, okay? He, he became as weak that he might gain the weak. In other words, he got down to their level. Uh, he got down to their level. And he said, I am made all things to all men that I might all, by all means save some. In other words, he, he sort of got off his high horse, so to speak, and, and got on their living terms so he could reach them for Jesus Christ. You see, the first characteristic of a true rescuer is we have to be realistic. We have to be realistic about the person, about the situation. We have to be realistic for, for beginning with ourselves. And then he says that they must be redemptive. Look at verse 20. Let him know that he which covereth the sinner from the air of his way shall save a soul from death. To save a soul from death. Uh, he's speaking here of uh, the priority of Christians. The priority of every one of us is the souls of men. That needs to be our priority of, our, of every Christian and every church. That's why we're here is to train a disciple, uh, men, women, boys, and girls, to, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But at the same time, we, ought, we have to be interested in the souls of men people coming to Jesus Christ. And then third, he says that we must be reliable. We must be reliable. That little phrase, and she'll hide a multitude of sins. In other words, uh, he's speaking here that we have to value the reputation of another believer, uh, another brother in Christ. That word hide means to hinder the knowledge of a thing. It means to impede uh, the negative fallout, so to, so to speak. In other words, knowing that we're sinners who've been saved by grace, we have no right to hold somebody else's sin over them uh, and keep them from coming to Christ. Well, we see the sin of which we're often guilty. We see the standard by which we're always governed. We see the system through which we're hopefully guided. Okay, We've got to be realistic. We have to have a redemptive mindset. We've got to be reliable. Okay, But lastly, uh, we, we see the sentence that can hopefully be avoided. But before we get to that thought pattern, let me just say, uh, in this idea, this word hide is an interesting word. Uh, as I go back to that word hide just a minute uh, in verse 20 to get the conclusion of what he's saying. It really means to procure a pardon from the Lord. Uh, it means to cover or atone for. Uh, actually, it's the uh, type of pardon that only comes through honest confession and genu genuine repentance. So in other words, as you think about that, he's talking about Galatians chapter 6, uh, verse 1 through verse 6, which is a powerful text. Uh, but as you get this idea of uh, it's really three things that we've got to continue doing uh, that he's building upon here. First of all, we've got to remain compassionate. We've got to remain compassionate. Uh, then second, we've got to remain cautious. We've got to have, be cautious about our own lives. We've got to be cautious. We've got to be compassionate. And we've got to live with commitment. We've got to be committed. And the only thing that will keep us from erring is to remain compassionate toward others, to remain compassionate toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, the only thing to keep us from erring, from wandering from the truth or drifting away, is we've got to be cautious. When we get to the place where we think, well, I won't do that. You wouldn't catch me doing that. You better be very, very careful because you're setting yourself up for a flop and a failure automatically. And we've got to be very careful that we don't, uh, that we lose our commitment to the things of God. And then that leads me, of course, to what I've already said to the fourth point. I want to make out these two verses as we close out this little series. The sentence that can be hopefully avoided. Uh, keep in mind, uh, he says, Let him know that he which covereth the sinner uh, from the air of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. You see, there's a sentence that we can experience, an individual can experience if he or she strays. If he strays, roams about, drifts away from the truth, and does not return. That's the real danger as we think about these last days. Those that you and I try to restore, uh, there's a sentence that comes with straying that we've got to be mindful of. First of all, the person that does that, the person that strays, uh, he or she can be disciplined by God. Hebrews chapter 12 is very clear. Uh, because he, uh, the writer of Hebrews deals with that very distinctly uh, in chapter uh, 12. He says in verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, 
and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? For if you be without chastisement, that word chastisement means discipline, whereof are all partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. In other words, you're, you're, not a, you're not a child of God if you don't experience the chastening of God or discipline of God. If you've walked away, if you've strayed away, if you've backslidden, so to speak, uh, and you fail to want to be restored, I don't know when the last note knot is in that rope. I don't know. I know where it was at for me, and you've heard me mention that many, many times. But there is an end of conclusion, and we know that. We can, the sentence that can hopefully be avoided, first of all, is the avoiding the discipline of God. And you've heard it say many times, the reason we do communion is so that we can stop. And he said, do this often in remembrance of me. It, it was given as an ordinance to the church so that we could examine ourselves, we can judge ourselves, so he wouldn't have to judge us. And if you remember, and you study that First Corinthians passage, there were several in that church that had died premature deaths because they failed to judge themselves, and they were living evidently in open apparent sin. They had drifted away, as this scripture says, they had they had erred, they had strayed, they had wandered, they had roamed about, and somewhere along the way, some of them probably even had fallen for heresy, and therefore they faced the chastening of God, and that's why we're challenged and we're given the opportunity often in communion to judge ourselves so, and uh, examine ourselves so he won't judge us, okay, as we put all the scripture together. So we see, first of all, the sentence that can hopefully be avoided, uh, he can be disciplined by God, or option number two, he can face the danger of committing the sin unto death. Now there's two scriptures that deal with that very, very vividly. Uh, first of all, the first one was in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. Uh, I've sort of given you that already because that's the one that he dealt with already. Uh, he says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, in verse 29, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Uh, for this cause, for this very reason, uh, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That word sleep means to be dead. Okay? So he said, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened to the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So there's the scripture I've just given you uh, to prove what I've just said. So we see we can face the danger of committing the sin unto death. And then 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 16 through verse 17. He said, If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Notice this next sentence. There is a sin unto death. Okay? I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Okay? So we know that there is a sin that is unto death. There is a sin that is not unto death. So understand that. I believe that that sin unto death is when you get to the place, uh, if, you're a, if you're an unbeliever and you, you say no to God, you say no to God, you say no to God, eventually somewhere along the way, uh, grace is going to run out for you on this side of the eternity. It's going to run out. Okay, when you refuse uh, in, to a place. I don't know where that cutoff is. That's between God and man. But then for the believer, there's also a, a cutoff as well. There's a knot at the end of the rope. Okay, uh, when, when the individual goes so far, according to the scripture, he says in this text, If a man see his brother sin a sin, which is not a death, he shall ask, he shall give him life for them that sin not, that sin not unto death. Okay, so there is a sin that's unto death, a sin not unto death. Uh, we don't know when that, that final crossing over is. Okay, that's between God and man. Okay, uh, I believe with all my heart that I've pastored some people. I've seen some people that I believe with all my heart. Listen, I believe they sinned the sin unto death. I believe they crossed that line. God would give them chance after chance after chance. They were raised in church. Uh, they followed believers' baptism. Listen, they, they, and somewhere along the way, uh, they, they begin to drift. They either fell for heresy. Uh, they backslid. They strayed on God. And I believe, I believe they were 
probably genuinely saved. They'd given their heart and life to Christ, but they didn't grow. They didn't develop. And somewhere along the way, the world, the flesh, and the devil attacked them, and they wandered so far away that there was no turning back. And when you get that far, when you get that far, and you're shaming the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, listen, he's going to discipline you. And you, if you don't follow that discipline uh, and that correction he makes, if he's not going to get any, any longer benefit out of you, if he can't use you for testimony and witness and you're shaming him, his son, and shaming the church, there is biblically a premature death. Okay? Uh, it's, it's seen here. Okay? But here's, here's what we need to understand in all this. Every one of us knows somebody that's straying. We know somebody that's straying. We know somebody that's probably backslidden. We know somebody that needs to be restored. So the challenge to us here is in these last days, this is what James is saying. James is saying in these last days, understand, if it wasn't for the grace of God, brethren, he says, you could be erring from truth. It could be you. There's a possibility if it wasn't for God's grace in your life, you could be in jail. If it wasn't for God's grace in your life, you could be over there doing crack. If it wasn't for God's grace in your life, you'd be in the bar tonight. If it wasn't for God's grace in your life, he says, but when you think about these people, who haven't seen the light and they haven't yielded to the, to the truth in their life, he says, pray for them, love on them, pursue them, and try to bring them back to where they need to be in the body of Christ and in a fellowship with Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. What a challenge. And folks, in these last days, our hearts ought to be heavy. Our hearts need to be hungry for people that are, have departed in their walk with God. People that you know, people that I know, and we, we got to start by praying for them, praying for them, interceding for them, calling them out by name. You know, there's also a warning here for you and I, uh, how easily it could be me or it could be you that strays away, that's back, that can backslide, that can be living in error. And we got to be mindful that... To, we understand the grace of God upon our lives in these last days. Man, we don't have any time to waste, folks. We don't have any time to mess and dabble with the, with the cares of this world. We don't have any time. We've got to be realistic. We've got to be redemptive. And we've got to be reliable in our walk with God so others can see Jesus living in and through us in these days in which we live. You know, Peter got a warning from the Lord, didn't he? You remember Peter? He got this same scripture was in a sense could be applied to Peter's life so easily. Peter was warned by Jesus that Satan. Listen, he remind he said that Satan was at hand to, uh, that was at hand to tempt him, didn't he? You remember? Uh, but Peter refused to believe the word that the Lord spoke to him, and uh, he even argued with the Lord. And uh, he said, "I'll never betray you, Lord." Before he knew it, that cock had crowed three times at him. He had already three times, listen, in the same day. You see, he should have been listening and praying, but you know what he was doing? He was arguing and sleeping. <laughs> you see, we've got to be mindful of that when we apply that to our lives. Folks, we can't sleep any longer. We don't have time to argue about temporal things, things that don't really matter, of no significance. People need Jesus. In these last days, there's a word for you and I to be restorers. Every one of us knows somebody that needs to be restored. They need a kind word. They need a card. They need, they need to be encouraged. You see, we got Thanksgiving coming up. Hey, invite them to Thanksgiving meal here. <laughs> We got Christmas coming up. Invite them to the Christmas play. They'll come to something like that one. They won't come to anything else. All of us know somebody, somebody in the church that's wandered away. They've drifted away for various reasons. I know some. You know some. There's not many that I don't think about every day. Get them on your heart. Pray for them. Try to encourage them to get back where they need to be in these last days. That's our challenge tonight for all of us, okay, uh, is to, to, to reach them, to, to pray for them, that God would deal with our hearts to get them out of that straying, backsliding condition. You know, I thought about that. Uh, sometimes, if we're not careful, you know what we do? We, we can almost treat a, a stray cat or a stray dog nicer than we can somebody that's supposed to be our brother and sister in Christ that's 
straight away, don't we? Think about it. You get an old stray dog or cat comes to your house. You know what you do? You get out some milk. You get out some bread and you start feeding it. And you know what? Before long after you start feeding that dog, and you know what that dog or cat will do? It'll stay on it. And before long, guess what? I thought about Miss Sherry Tucker. You go to her house, there's 4911 cats around her house. And it started with feeding, one, giving milk or bread to one little cat out there. And you go to her house, and they're all over the place. They're on the blame car. They're on top of the carport. But she wouldn't, she wouldn't make any of them leave. And it started with one cat. <laughs> one cat just her showing her love to. Feeding it, taking care of it. And she had done it one at a time. And then before long, you know what happened? She had so many she couldn't even count them. Sometimes it's like that with the Christian faith. With reaching other people, you start with one. You realize in most, in most settings, if you'll get that dad, get right with God, you'll get the whole family in with God. Ninety-something percent of the time when the dad gets right, when the dad gets saved or gets in church and is faithful to God, it'll have an impact on the rest of the family. That says a lot, folks. I say that to say this. Listen, there are people all around us, people we know that have erred. They've drifted away from the truth. Uh, they've strayed. They've backslid. Let's start reaching them through prayer. Then use kindness. Try to do what you know to do whoever God lays on your heart to reach out to. And I'll reach out to the people he touches my heart. Now, I want to go ahead and tell you, everybody doesn't want to cooperate, okay? I, I, let me go ahead and tell you, everybody's not going to be receptive of your invitation, of your kindness, okay? Why? Because some of them got hard-hearted, okay? Some of them have unforgiveness that's festered up, and they can't get over it. I, I'll go ahead and tell you that, okay? You're not going to get everybody right. That doesn't mean that we don't do that we don't do what we know to do to help those who have erred or drifted away. Well, let's all stand tonight. Danny's going to come and play. Great challenge for every one of us tonight as we close out this little series. Why? In the last days, as we bow our head and close our eyes for just a moment, I really believe he give it. He gave is like a a bomb. It was like a shotgun approach in this fifth chapter. There was a word for the rich. There was a word for the, for the redeemed. There was a word for the restricted. There was a word for the righteous. And there was a word for the restorers. Fits almost every walk of the church in this, in this closing letter he wrote, chapter he wrote in James. And it was all concerning the last days of what we have the responsibility to do. It's up to us. It's up to us to share the truth and to live in the truth to a world that's departed from God in these last days. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, how challenging, Lord, this, these last two verses are in this chapter. And Lord, this book is simple, it's practical, but it's, it's very applicable. And Lord, I pray that you'd help every one of us tonight, Lord, first of all, to stay close and cling to the Lord Jesus Christ so that we won't stray, so that we won't drift away or fall away, so that we won't have to experience the chastening hand of God. And may we be mindful of that. And many of us have been in places where you had have had to chasten us. But thank you for forgiveness and grace tonight. But Lord, we pray for those tonight, Lord, that have drifted away, or those that have fallen away, they've backslid, on the things of God. And Lord, we can see it as apparent. And Lord, I pray that we begin to pray for them. I pray we begin to reach out to them and help them to see their waywardness. And Lord, I pray that right now that the Holy Spirit would go before we ever go and start dealing with hearts. Help us to pray and be sensitive to the direction and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I realize Thanksgiving and Christmas is coming up. And Lord, those are two times that we're together as family and friends, and it's times that you've made available. Lord, that we can use. We can use to reach those people that sometimes we don't normally see. And we can encourage them, maybe through a kind word, maybe through a, a personal challenge, maybe a prayer. 
whatever it is, I pray that we'd take that platform and we'd use it to carry forth this message tonight, realizing that every one of us knows somebody that's drifted away. They've erred from the truth. And Lord, help us tonight, Lord, to get them on our hearts. But Lord, may they not just be on our hearts, but may they be on our mind and may they burden us that we'd reach out to them in the occasions coming up here real soon. Again, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for what you're going to do and what all you have done in Jesus' name. Amen.